In this week's episode of Bleach the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Grimjo, Nell, and the Fullbringers assist Ichigo in his return to the Royal Palace. The Gote 13 completes their Divine Gate, and Yu Harbark uses his new power to create his Quincy Nation, Varvelt. You know, as I was watching the episode this week and reacting to it, it crossed my mind that this might be an easier review to make than usual. For the most part, we have a fairly faithful adaptation this week. There isn't an enormous swath of new content, though there is plenty new here peppered throughout, but ultimately it all culminates in the same place as the original story. At long last, the plot threads have converged and arrived at their destined point. The Shinigami and their allies have invaded Varvelt at the crest of its holy creation, and the final battle looms. So, this week, while the setup for the final showdown continues here in episode 32, The Holy Newborn, don't be fooled, this isn't a quiet, unassuming affair. In fact, some enormous, world-changing events take place this week that get law nerds like me very excited. If there's one thing you have to admit about the Vandenreich, it's that they get stuff done. Eisen, as much as I love the guy, was the main villain for a very long time, and yet the status quo of Bleach kind of stagnated. Yu Harbuck is a man of action by comparison, and this episode is yet another showcase of that in full force. One of my favourite things about the Thousand Year Blood War arc is how high the stakes feel, and a lot of that stems from the fact that Kubo simply wasn't afraid to completely turn the world of Bleach on its head in this arc. It was like he was unshackled. Before the Quincy wasted no time in invading and replacing the Serete, this time the villains succeed in totally transforming the royal palace itself, creating something wholly new in its wake. So yes, the palace is no more. In its place sits Varvelt, looming eerily against a pitch-black, never-ending void of a sky. I wonder if the sky around the Serete looks the same also. I would assume so. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why the sky has changed colour, especially so dramatically, but it is a cool visual. Anyway, we're getting off track already. The point is, the world of Bleach, which was otherwise unchanged for the most part until now, has really been put through its paces in the final arc, and that's absolutely on show here in this episode in a big way. So, as we begin our in-depth spoiler review and discussion of the Thousand Year Blood War arc episode 32, The Holy Newborn, as always, I'll be looking at this episode from the perspective of someone who has read all of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, meaning there will be potential spoilers for the entire arc to follow. As we take a look at this episode to see what it added, what it changed, and what it took away from the source material. However, guys, before we get started, once you are done with this video, if you enjoyed it and you want to see more from me and the channel moving forward, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below now, as it really does help me out, and I really do appreciate the support. Let's get started then, and as always, we'll first take a look at what chapters are covered in this week's episode. And to be honest, it's a much more streamlined affair than we're currently used to. Again, the reason for that is that we are mostly out of the woods in regards to the older plot lines that hadn't yet been adapted. I say mostly because we still have to take a brief trip backwards to some older chapters here, but for the most part it is full steam ahead now. And I have a feeling that's going to be the case for the rest of the core now too, considering the vast majority of the second half of part three is going to be made up of fights, which aren't likely to need restructuring on the same level as some of the more plot-heavy sequences. So, without further ado, these are the chapters covered in episode 32. Firstly, we have chapter 613, The Ordinary Peace. Chapter 617, Return of the God. Chapter 625, Living Jaguar. Chapter 626, The Holy Newborn, the title of this week's episode. Chapter 627, The Creation. Chapter 628, New World Orders. And finally, Chapter 629, Gate of the Sun. 
So yeah, as expected, aside from a couple of chapters at the start there, we are now mostly on the straight and narrow, making the upcoming episodes perhaps a little easier to predict. Though, based on the poem at the end of this week's episode, maybe that's not going to be the case. But we'll get to that, we'll get to that. For now, before we move on, what did I think of the Rayo's Death mini-arc in the anime? For all intents and purposes, that period of the story is now over. The characters have arrived in Varvelt, signalling the final act of the arc. While this portion of the final arc is never officially given a subtitle or separated out in any way from the rest, I've always personally considered chapters 612 to 628 to be the Rayo's Death sub-arc. It nestles in perfectly between the end of the second Quincy invasion, which comes about with chapter 611 and Yuha Bark stabbing Rayo, and chapter 629, which sees the Shinigami and their allies advancing into Varvelt for the first time and even engaging the enemy. And it's here that we saw the anime diverge heavily from the source material, while staying true to the overall plot beats from these chapters. The anime added several brand new fights, specifically for Ichigo, Ichigo vs. Yuha Bark Round 2, and of course the much-anticipated Ichigo vs. Uryu, which has finally been realised and restructured events completely, both down in the Serete and up within the Royal Palace. And to be honest, I think the new version for the anime succeeds in many ways. I always loved this part of the arc, but ultimately I did prefer the scenes with the Gote 13 in the Serete over the showdown in the palace. Now, while I liked both, the palace showdown always felt a bit messy and a bit unsatisfying, while the scenes with the Gote 13 provided some wonderful coming together of disparate characters, delivering some excellent and unexpected exchanges. The anime manages to mostly keep that sensation while expanding on the Gote 13's involvement in all the right places, giving Ukitake a lovely, detailed flashback while also incorporating far more of the Gote 13 than ever really thought possible, but most importantly, it has vastly improved the Royal Palace Showdown. There's now a much greater sense of urgency, and everything is just that bit neater. Many of the smaller plot points are laid out in full to the audience rather than being implied or inferred, making for a much less frustrating experience. In the anime, this really did feel like a fight, a desperate struggle to keep the world from falling apart, and at last both Ichigo and Uryu were given incredible, satisfying ways of showing off their newfound powers. I'm tempted to make a video on my feelings about this sub-arc in full, but we'll see. For now though, I really do think the anime did a splendid job, and I would love to see their notes and storyboards as they were deciding what to keep and what to cut, but most importantly what to move, and to where, and why. Anyway, let's dive into the spoiler analysis for the Thousand Year Blood War arc episode 32, titled The Holy Newborn, likely, I imagine, to be the last of the setup chapters before we get into some action. The episode opens with a shot of the new Shinigami plinth, giving us a great view of the Wall of Toes, which is a lovely way to start things off. Strangely, the stern Ritter who last week were standing at the top alongside the other characters heading into Varvelt are now down by the base with the newly arrived Shinigami from across the city. Kisuke asks everyone to hold out their hands, and as he does so, a gleaming orb appears in his palm. The gathered forces do the same, and similar orbs materialise across the ranks in a wave of golden light. Of course, the spirit orbs were the last remaining plot thread. It's ironic, really. In the manga, they are first introduced back in chapter 613, making them one of the absolute earliest components of the Rayo's Death sub-arc to appear, but here they're right at the end. 
everything that happens after their appearance in the manga has already taken place. As such, their introduction is quite different here. In the manga, Kisuke says that he'll be handing the orbs out, again, easier when there are fewer characters involved, and everyone has to come and step into a ring of light being generated by the royal tools brought by Yushiro. The Vizard haven't even shown up to fill the ring with spirit energy yet at this point in the manga. As I mentioned in my video looking at every cameo character, this is also the first time we see Hanataro, who also travels up to the royal palace, though his appearance is fleeting. I assume he will travel up to the palace in the same manner that he does in the manga, though considering he is down on the ground while Kenpachi, Ikako and Yumichika aren't, I'm not sure how that's going to work. As everyone begins to pour their Rerioku into the orbs, including the three turncoat Sternritter, the gate begins to materialise before their very eyes. A brilliant, divine light floods into the archway, creating a glittering golden door. Suddenly, however, the earth begins to shake again, sending Nico Kuna flying. Speaking of which, I am glad to see the full slate of research and development characters are still here for the final push. Akon, Hiyosu, Nico, but Rin too. As Kisuke wonders what on earth is going on, he turns to see the very Quincy city surrounding them itself being lifted up into the air by the remnants of the Soul King's power. It's a really cool visual. The eyeball monsters that have now been turned into a black ooze, a sludge almost, are clinging onto the buildings and helping to carry them into the sky. Entire castles, cathedrals, towers and more are ascending to the heavens above, being ripped from the Serete below. Again, in the manga, this doesn't actually happen just yet. We haven't even seen what Yu Harbark looks like properly, and he's already flexing his new power. In the source material, chapter 626 ends with Yu Harbark declaring that he will rebuild their nation, and the Vandenreich buildings begin to just simply lift from the Serete. There, in the manga, Yu Harbark doesn't have the assistance of the Soul King's power, not in a tangible way at least, and the buildings simply float upwards. Again, I like both versions, though it's interesting that so much of the Soul King's power was still hanging around after Aizen decimated much of it, and that it seemingly stopped trying to attack the Shinigami. Anyway, in terms of the source, we've skipped ahead a bit, finding ourselves about halfway through chapter 627, as the Shinigami look on in disbelief at the sight of the Quincy City being hoisted into the sky. Interestingly, the original chapter shows the Serete buildings themselves being uncovered, but in the anime we don't see the Shinigami City just yet. In moments taken directly from the chapter, Soifon wonders what the Quincy's are possibly trying to do, while Shinji angrily asks if their enemies have any limits to what they can achieve. This is a nice little line from Shinji in my opinion. I don't think it is highlighted enough that the Quincy are uniquely positioned to be a totally broken race in Bleach. As a faction, they didn't use their complete dominion over Reishi enough, but moments like like this really show you that they can technically do anything. Reishi is but a plaything to them after all, and when you're as powerful a Quincy as Yu Harbak is, the entire world is yours to remake, as we see here. After the opening, we head back to the cliffhanger of chapter 624, as the Garganta opens before Ichigo and the others, revealing none other than the sixth Espada, Grimjo. We then move immediately into chapter 625 as Grimjo leaps from the gateway, landing before Ichigo, the two of them squaring off. Ichigo is of course immediately wary, and their exchange plays out identically to the source material. One thing I've never really thought about until this review is that in the original chapter the Squad Zero Reden they are currently hiding out on is totally destroyed, meaning the death of the Soul King hits the Reden particularly hard, which would make sense as they are essentially at the epicentre. In that sense, it's weirder that the palace is seen totally untouched in the anime. Anyway, Grimjo asks Ichigo if he thought he had died before unsheathing his sword, preparing for a fight. 
The Espada tells Ichigo with a mad look in his eye that he's been waiting for this day to come as Ichigo readies his own blade, the Iranka desperate to get his revenge and settle their score once and for all. It's funny to think that Grimjo would get completely annihilated by this version of Ichigo, but you know, Props to him for his optimism, I guess. However, before anything can break out, Grimjo is bowled over by the arrival of another Espada. It's Nell, once again in her adult form, as she comes flying out of the Garganta to hug Ichigo. Sending Ichigo crashing to the ground, Nell excitedly tells him that Kisuke made her a bracelet that allows her to switch between her child and adult forms at will. But as she notes, she may never go back to being a child again, which, let's face it, would make sense. I don't really know why she would ever go back to her child form. There doesn't seem to be any benefit whatsoever. But as Nell says that she might never go back to being a child again, we cut to Orohime, who is wearing a truly terrifying expression, clearly trying to suppress some rage she's feeling towards Kisuke, likely hoping that Nell wouldn't become an adult again and potentially steal away Ichigo. As Chad mutters to Orohime that while she might be wondering why Kisuke would do something so unnecessary as make Nell that bracelet, that she needs to remember that he is trying his best. This is an interesting moment, and there is no doubt that during this run of the story, Kubo was making the Orohime and Ichigo connection a lot more explicit, at least from Orohime's viewpoint anyway, and I'm intrigued to see that this moment made the cut, while the earlier scene about Orohime's clothes didn't. In fact, this episode is positively full of jokes and comedic moments. It really is the calm before the storm in that sense. Again, this whole sequence plays out totally faithfully to the manga. Grimjo gets back on his feet, barking at Nell to stay out of his way. Nell talks down to him, telling him to leave if he's going to start a fight. And interestingly, she tries to pull rank on him, telling him that as a number three, she doesn't take orders from a number six. But Grimjo quickly tells her that with Aizen gone, those numbers don't mean a thing anymore, and that if they want to find out which one of them is stronger, then he's ready to fight right now. I have to admit, I do love that Grimjo's only been around for a few minutes at this point, and yet he's already tried to pick a fight with two different people. However, as Ichigo quickly comes between the two of them, a new voice rings out from inside the Garganta. The Garganta opens even more, which, by the way, how does that actually work? Surely it has to be either Grimjo or Nell opening the gateway like that. Anyway, a strange black box is revealed, attached to both a flight of stairs and a set of what appear to be tracks. When the door is thrown open, Ichigo is shocked to see the fullbringer Riruka standing before him, complete with a brand new outfit. As she snaps at him to get inside quickly, another newcomer makes his presence known, the fullbringer Yukio. In the anime, Ichigo is given a new line here. He happily notes that he knew they were both alive. This is a bit of a weird line in some respects. In regards to Yukio, it does make sense as Ichigo didn't see him again after the battle with Ginjo concluded, but with Riruka, well... I mean, she was there with Ichigo in Urahara's shop in the aftermath of the fight, so that's a bit odd. Either way, everyone enters the box, which was made using Yukio's power. So yeah, all of that was actually identical to the manga, which is cool. Though I am a little disappointed that neither Grimjo or Nell mentioned Haribel even once. I was hopeful that the anime might add a little subplot somewhere, showing them rescuing her, but that might have been a pipe dream. I don't know. There's still time, I suppose, anything could reasonably happen. Anyway, with everyone now inside Yukio's box, this is the culmination of the Waco Mundo subplot plot that's been quietly trucking along in the background. Since their battle with Kirige at the start of the arc, Kisuke set up camp in the Hollow World and began recruiting people to their cause. Grimjo, who killed Kirige as well as Nell, who arrived with Orohime and Chad. Later, Rinuka and Yukio were summoned as well, creating a crack team of specialists who could aid in the war effort from the shadows. A great example of Kisuke's ability to think however many steps ahead. The coming together of these different characters in Waco Mundo has always been one of my favourite through lines of the arc, as it really shows off the potential of gathering characters from all across the story. 
I only wish a couple of other faces had been included, but then to be fair, we barely had time for everyone here. A new joke is included in the anime where Ichigo turns to Orohime and Chad, clueless about what's going on, only for them to reveal they've known about all of this since their time in Waco Mundo. As Yoroichi then begins to explain everything to Ichigo in the manga, there is a meta joke about how the panel has already changed to a diagram. Kubo does like to do this from time to time, particularly here in the final arc, I think, but in the anime it is nicely contextualized as Yukio projects the diagram onto the ceiling of the box, which is quite a clever touch by the anime team. So, what exactly is going on? It is kind of complicated, but I'll try and break it down. There are three main worlds in Bleach, the Soul Society, the World of the Living, and Waco Mundo. The Soul Society and the World of the Living are connected by the Dungai, a passageway designed to allow safe travel between those two worlds, accessed via the Shinigami Senkaimon. Completely surrounding the Soul Society, the World of the Living, and the Dungai is a space known as Garganta, essentially empty negative space which the Hollows use to travel from Waco Mundo, which itself is only accessible via Garganta. Ichigo and the others have travelled directly through Garganta before, and as you might remember, it is virtually impossible to just exist in that space. Spirit energy is incredibly unstable there, and you can't even stand without constantly creating a footpath for yourself with your own power. However, there are certain spaces within Garganta that it is possible for Reishi to exist within. These spaces are called Kyogoku, and they act almost like little pocket dimensions. They exist because the structure of their reishi is different to that of Garganta, meaning they don't instantly become a part of the abyss along with everything else. Somehow, and this is probably the most nebulous part, Kisuke used Riruka's ability of dollhouse to move one of these Kyogoku spaces into a box, after which Yukio used his ability of Invaders Must Die to turn that box into a digital domain that he could freely control, building it into a livable room attached to a set of rails. Yoroichi then reveals that they can only move between the two stakes that she set, one in the Squad Zero Reden and the other by the Soul King himself up in the throne room. Which does make me wonder how the box arrived at the Reden in the first place, unless the box can travel from its starting point, the point of its creation, to the first stake, but I'm not sure. Because if the box was put together, here in the royal palace in the Reden, how did they get there in the first place? Either way, they'll now be able to sneak back into the throne room without their spiritual pressure being noticed. Yoroichi hopes that as a result, they'll be able to take their enemies down in one surprise strike. Back in the Soul Society, we are treated to an amended version of a scene from chapter 617. All of the issues with regards to building the royal gate are collapsed into one sequence here, which I think makes sense. Originally in the manga, they struggle to build the gate numerous times. Here in chapter 617, when they discover they don't have enough Ryoku with Ukitake gone. Again in chapter 622, when Aizen's power demolishes the gate. And again in chapter 623, when the arrival of the Quincy's disturbs the process again. But here, that has all kind of been condensed into one moment where the gate falters. The gold light begins to fracture and split apart as the gate breaks down before their very eyes. Nanao comments that they need Ukitake, as no other captain could come close to the spiritual pressure he possesses. That's an interesting rewrite of her line from the original chapter. There, Nanao reveals that Ukitake's power has always been incredible because he had to sustain his debilitated body with his Ryoku, but here, she just straight up says that he has more power than any other captain for no real reason. As Nanao despairs, however, someone else rests their hand on her orb. It's Lisa Yadomaru in a lovely moment that directly calls back to the Turn Back the Pendulum arc, where a very young Nanao would often read with Lisa. 
As Lisa tells her it's not over yet, the other Vizard return, having put on their Shihaku show. Orbs appear in Hiori, Love and Hachi's hands, and they too begin to lend their power. Interestingly, while Hiori and Love have their Zanpakuto with them, Hachi doesn't appear to be carrying one at all. And we know he has one, so that's kind of weird. Anyway, it's at this point in the manga that Mayuri returns to the lab, but since he's already here in the anime, he tells Kisuke that the numbers show they don't have enough power, before wondering why he just isn't using the spiritual pressure amplifier. If you ask me, it does make a little less sense here as you have to wonder why Mayuri wouldn't just activate the amplifier immediately rather than waiting for the gate to collapse, since in the anime he's been here all this time, but I guess Mayuri wanted to get one over Kisuke wherever possible. The amplifier emerges from beneath Kisuke's plinth and activates a blinding golden light surging and whirring within it. It looks really awesome, to be honest. And as in the manga, the amplifier helps to finalise the gate, once again flooding the archway with a shimmering light. Though, as I mentioned earlier, the gate fails again once Aizen turns up in the manga, whereas here, we are now totally finished. And I really do love how the gate looks here in the anime. The episode makes it look suitably grand, and the colours are amazing. I love the almost sunlight effect beaming from this doorway. It really does look heavenly. And I actually think this is a really interesting visual in general. The opulent brilliance of the gate standing tall in the centre of this screen while all around it the Quincy City continues to be lifted into the sky. A twisted mass of blue, black and the red of the background going on behind everything. The cityscape being pulled upwards while this is happening really lends to the sense of urgency and I like that both sides are now on the move simultaneously. The Shinigami act to reach the palace in the manga, of course, too, but here it feels like they are moving faster. We close out this scene with a wonderful new shot of Kyoraku as he promises not to let Ukitake's sacrifice be in vain. Again, it's unclear what fate has actually befallen Ukitake here in the anime, and how he's even still connected to Mimihagi now that Yuhabak has fully absorbed Reio. Mimi Hagi, in that sense, shouldn't even exist. Returning to chapter 626, Yoroichi informs Ichigo of the plan. They'll mount a surprise attack. So long as Yuhabak and his men haven't moved since their last battle, then they should arrive right behind them. In a new sequence, Yoroichi tells Ichigo to use his strongest Getsuga while they keep the others away from him, to which Ganju says that they will deal with the minions. Ichigo agrees, telling them he's counting on their help, but this is all awfully optimistic. I'd like to know exactly how Ganju thinks they'll deal with the minions when they couldn't defeat them about 10 minutes ago. On the flip side, it is cool to see Yoroichi fully trusting in Ichigo's incredible power, to the point where she now gives him the lead. After this, we get a rewritten moment for Chad, which is a little odd. Here in the episode, Chad comments that they have a good understanding of the Royal Guard's powers. Again, I have no idea where this is coming from, how or why they think they know that, considering they didn't really see any of them at all, before he asks Ichigo what they know about Yuhabark's abilities. Ichigo looks away, however, unsure really of what Yuhabark can actually do, only that he defeated him pretty soundly, leading Orihime to wish they'd asked Ichibe more. But in the manga, Chad doesn't ask about Yuhabark at all. Instead, he asks Yoroichi about Pernida's ability, having seen the hooded Sternritter attack Yoroichi during the last showdown. Yoroichi replies that she doesn't know, as her arm was twisted before she could tell what was going on, telling them to stay away from Pernida as she will deal with him from a distance instead. To be honest, this version of the discussion makes way more sense to me, as Chad would naturally want to know more about the one ability they did actually get to see in action. Anyway, as Orihime listlessly mopes about not managing to learn more, Riluka scolds her for worrying so much about the past before slapping her across the face with her bunny ears. 
That's a weird sentence to say without any context, but either way, I'm glad that Orohime and Rinuka get a little moment here, as it feels like a direct callback to some of their exchanges in the Lost Agent arc. Ichigo then wonders why Grimjo has joined their side, to which Grimjo simply replies he hasn't. But if Yuhabark has his way, then Waco Mundo will be destroyed, leaving no place left for Grimjo to kill Ichigo. Smirking, Ichigo says that the Espada has a good point, as they rocket towards the palace above. On the whole, this sequence is handled pretty well, I think. As I mentioned earlier, it is, for the most part, very faithful. Every exchange involving both Grimjo and Nell, and possibly even Rinuka and Yukio, appears exactly as it does in the manga, which is really nice to see. Moving on, however, we return to the throne room of the palace. Yuhabak has fully absorbed the Soul King himself, meaning the entire ending of chapter 625 has been cut. There, we saw the Schutzstoffel lounging around on sofas and picking at fruit while waiting for Yuhabak to finish taking Rayo's power. It was an interesting little scene as Uryu seemed to drop his mask for a moment, with Gerard wondering why he looked so glum, leading to shots of both Hashwolf and Leel as they continue to suspect Uryu's true motives. I also liked the little details on show here too, the knocked over sideboard and vase for example showing that they don't have any regard for this holy place. As the chapter comes to an end, we see Yuhabark standing at last, now completely covered in black, as the Soul King's empty crystal crumbles before him. Of course, in the anime, much of this has been collapsed into one scene. Yuhabark absorbs the Soul King entirely right then and there in front of the Schutzstoffel, and everything from the end of chapter 625 and most of 626 is now together in one place. There's an interesting new moment here where Uryu thinks about what's happened so far, Ichigo slashing Reo, as well as him falling through the sky after being shot. Ichigo is clearly on Uryu's mind then, but he can't let that show. Finding ourselves now in chapter 626, Yuhabak stands tall, a black, oil-like slime oozing from him and running across the ground. Yuhabak himself is now surrounded by a strange, unnatural Reiatsu, dark blue and jet black, ebbing and flowing from him like flames. Again, the start of this scene from chapter 626 has been cut, where Hashwolf informs the rest of the Schutzstoffel that the old Soul King is gone, and that there's a new world lying before them. Also cut is the Schutzstoffel walking back into the throne room, with Askin wondering what this bubbling, tar-like black goop is that's now running along the ground. However, in the anime, Yuhabak turns to his children and at last reveals his new appearance. The entire top half of his face is now covered in a dripping black mask, but even more terrifying is the assortment of spider-like eyes that open with a disgusting squelch, giving Yuhabak a truly alien appearance. I was always curious how they were going to achieve Yuhabark's new eldritch look here in the anime, and I think for the most part they've done an alright job. It was always going to be tough, I think, to really get the desired effect, and it does kind of look like the eyes are just superimposed on top of the black mask, but they are creepy, and they are weird at least. Like I said in my reaction, I was never a big fan of this look anyway. Sometimes Kubo made it work and I understood what he was going for, but sometimes it just looked too goofy, like Yuhabark had a bunch of googly eyes just stuck to his head. But the idea behind it is undeniably cool. Yuhabark is now truly all-seeing, and the overflowing power of the Almighty is now seeping down him. That's perhaps another issue I have with the anime's version that will hopefully be fixed in episodes to come. It's just too tidy. It looks weird because for the most part, this oozing mass of power is just confined 
perfectly to Yu Harbach's hair and face. But in the manga, the black substance bubbles and drips down him, covering much of his entire body, slowly consuming him over time. Perhaps the same will happen here in the anime too, but for now at least, it kind of just looks like Yu Harbach is wearing a weird visor of sorts, as opposed to a surplus of godly power spilling down his form, sending even several of his eyes sliding down him. Anyway, the Schutzstoffel are horrified by the sight of their king, and in a moment taken from the manga, Askin instinctively takes a step back, bumping into Hashwolf. Hashwolf asks him what the matter is before telling him to calm down. Sweating nervously, Askin can't believe that Hashwolf doesn't find this strange at all. This was always a great moment in the source material. Askin really is just a regular guy that has somehow found himself amongst gods and monsters, and it's a humanising moment for villains that do kind of need it. Also, just a small note, but Gerard's chest is like three times the size of Hashwalt's entire head in this frame, and it makes me laugh. Yu Harbach asks Askin if he's afraid of him, before telling him that he'll eventually get used to his appearance. It's a rare moment of Yu Harbach speaking directly to one of his men that isn't Hashwalf or Uryu, which is cool too. But of course, by having the Schutzstoffel look so afraid of Yu Harbach in this moment, it really sells the idea that he is like nothing we've ever seen before. However, a sinister grin creases along Yu Harbach's face as he revels in the fact that this is what it feels like to be overflowing with power. As he does so, we get another good look at the eyes. I like the way they are constantly moving as though they are writhing around in that inky black mass. That is pretty cool. Suddenly, Yu Harbach destroys the entire top of the palace with his new power, completely devastating the throne room ceiling and throwing chunks of stone up into the air. To be honest, I was always convinced that this was Yu Harbach's doing, but now I have to wonder if this isn't just a result of the fact the Soul King is now completely gone. The world is destabilizing in a big way once again, and the palace is right at the center of that. Askin springs into action, running like a madman as he's tossed into the sky along with the rubble. The rest of the Schutzstoffel secure themselves as well, including a lovely hint to Pernida's true identity, as it seemingly grabs onto a piece of stone with its head. Clinging onto the rubble for dear life, Askin shouts at Hashworth, wondering how he can be so calm, when in a new moment the Sternritter looks down to see the chunks of the city rising up from the Serete, being carried up by the Soul King's power. In complete disbelief himself still, Askin can't believe his eyes, and suddenly the rubble stops moving completely, allowing him to gain a footing. It is very smart of the anime to use Askin as an avatar for the audience in these moments. Yu Harbach is so beyond anything we have ever seen right now that we need an anchor point to at least keep some of this grounded. The Quincy King freezes everything in place, again showing his total control over Reishi at this point. Bowing before him, Hashwolf notes that now the Soul King is gone, the world can't exist without Yu Harbach's power holding it together. Hashwolf lifts his gaze, telling Yu Harbach to guide them. I have to say, Hashwolf looks a lot creepier here in the manga because you can't see the entirety of his features, which makes it more effective, I think. Anyway, Yu Harbach calls Hashwolf his first son. Again, something I find interesting considering the later revelation that Leal Barrow was in fact the first Sternritter to receive a shrift from Yu Harbach. So either that's been changed, it's been forgotten about, or Yu Harbach found Hashwolf before he found Leel, but perhaps wasn't giving out shrifts just yet. I really hope we get some answers regarding Sternritter backstory in an extended friend saga flashback, potentially pretty soon. Yu Harbach declares that he will begin by rebuilding their nation as his eyes glow blue. During my reaction, I think I said this effect looked pretty cool, but I've kind of softened on it a little bit since then. But regardless, it is awesome getting to actually see the creation of what would become Varvelt itself, and the sheer power involved to make it so.
In a new scene using his now limitless ability, Yuha Bark forges the cornerstone of their new world, each of the Squad Zero Reden suddenly glowing a fierce blue light. That blue light is then unleashed in a torrential blast towards the center point of the main palace itself, connecting it all together and transforming the royal palace into one gigantic Quincy cross as the color and power pulsates and ripples across the sky. Something is being built, but we don't yet know what. However, this is exactly what I was talking about at the start of the review when I said that there are some serious world-changing events taking place this week. As we reach this week's key cards, there is one thing I want to discuss. The Kyogoku. Now, for those of you that have seen the Bleach movies, the idea of the Kyogoku may have sounded familiar. That's because the Valley of Screams, another name for the Kyogoku, plays a major role in that first Bleach movie, The Memories of Nobody. To be honest, I might make a video about this now, because there's no denying the anime seems to be continuing to tie the movie in further. The art featured on the key card this week is a direct reference to a major character from the movie and a fan favourite, Senna, and her Zanpak To Mirokumaru, while the text seems to further confirm the movie's canonicity, reading as such, a gathering place for many lost souls, large and small, that exist around the boundary that connects the soul society and the world of the living. Souls that have been separated from the cycle of reincarnation between the world of the living and the soul society due to an accident while passing through the Dangai come together over a long period of time and form a valley of screams. It is not clear why the Valley of Screams alone can maintain a stable space within the Garganta, but it is believed to be due to their unique structure of Reishi. Ichigo Kurosaki once visited the Valley of Screams due to an incident involving the Shinenju. Thanks as always to Neonzel for the translation. To be honest, this seems to outright state that the first movie is in fact canon, which is pretty massive. This key card references numerous aspects of that first movie, including the blanks, which are a major component of the movie itself. The blanks are the souls that have been separated from the cycle of rebirth mentioned here, while Senna is in fact the Shinenju, also mentioned here, and the movie ends in such a way where the characters are supposed to forget about her. In that sense, it is possible that Memories of Nobody is canon and has occurred. Ichigo outright states later that he has visited the Valley of Screams before, so to be honest, it really does feel pretty concrete to me. In the manga, Many thought of it as little more than a reference, but with this key card especially, the anime seems to be doubling down on it. Anyway, returning now to chapter 627, Ichigo's gang prepares to arrive in Varvelt, as Yukio reminds them that he isn't leaving the box. This annoys both Ganju and Viruka, with Ganju in particular squaring up to Yukio in another scene taken straight from the manga. Again, the jokes are intact here, with neither Ganju nor Yukio remembering who the other actually is. Despite Ganju's objections, however, Ichigo agrees with Yukio, telling him to stay put. He then also tells Riruka to remain behind as well, which angers her. And I always liked that Riruka actually wanted to fight with them, and to be honest, it would have been cool to see that play out. However, we're then treated to what is by far the absolute best looking scene in the entire episode. To be honest, it looks so fantastic that it's not even close, and I have no idea why it is drawn so incredibly well. As Ichigo turns to Riruka to thank her for everything she's done for them with a genuine smile on his face, acknowledging that she went out of her way for them, Riduka blushes madly, still clearly harbouring feelings for Ichigo that were present back in the Lost Agent arc as well. Riduka's voice actor does an amazing job here too, really selling the fact that she is suddenly out of her comfort zone and feeling awkward, but also still wanting to help. Ichigo asks her to do one more thing for them. 
to stay put with Yukio in order to help get them out when the time comes. Honestly, there's no getting around it. This is Kubo level art. Riduka looks absolutely astonishingly well drawn in this sequence to the point where it stands out amongst the rest of the episode by a long way. It's a very nice moment in the manga to be fair and it is really brought to life here as well, putting a cap on Riduka's character in a great way. To be honest, I hope both she and Yukio show up again, because in the manga this is the last time we see either of them. As Ganju acknowledges that Ichigo appears to have grown up, we return to the Serete as the gate is finally completed. Mayuri smirks in a way that I think is hinting at the fact that he's going to be sneaking into Varvelt via a different route to everyone else. As both sides prepare to invade Varvelt at the same time, Ichigo and the gang open the door to their box and step out into what they expect will be the Royal Palace. By the way, considering they think they're going to be arriving right behind Yuharbark and the others, you think they'd leave the box with a little more gusto, akin to how Ichigo arrived in Karakura Town behind Aizen, but there you go. Meanwhile, Kisuke opens the gate for the Gotei 13, with the Shinigami leaving behind many who came to help, including the majority of the cameos from last week. With both teams stepping into the royal palace, they are shocked by what awaits them. Instead of the palace as we know it, Ichigo's gang is met with a shadowy Quincy city. The sky is a dreadful, oppressive pitch black, while the bone-white, ice-covered Quincy buildings are soaked in a sinister purple hue. Flitting back and forth between the end of chapter 627 and the start of chapter 628, the Gote 13 also arrive, taken aback by their new surroundings. Shinji barks at Kisuke, wondering where on earth they are, but Kisuke is adamant that their coordinates place them above the Serete. Meanwhile, Yoroichi discovers the stake she placed in the throne room, meaning they've arrived in the palace itself, though of course the stake was likely thrown off course massively by Yuhabark's power when the ceiling exploded, which explains why it is now outside of the palace itself. Imagine if it had fallen all the way back down to the Serete. As Kyoroku muses that their enemy has gathered such immense power as to be able to remake the palace itself, Yoroichi, Ichigo and the others turn around to see the ruinous remains of the Soul King's palace behind them, now covered in ice and darkness. Finding ourselves fully in chapter 628 now, Kyoraku and Kisuke make their way to the edge of the city, discovering it to be rounded, confirming that this must have been one of the Squad Zero Riden once before. It's interesting how much they know about the structure of the Royal Palace having never been there before, unless of course they have. We know Kisuke in particular once saw the Soul King and Tenjiro's Hot Springs, questions that really do need answering. As the Shinigami grapple with the terrifying fact that the palace has apparently been totally overthrown and has fallen into the enemy's hands, we get to see Yuharbark's new nation in all of its glory at last. The royal palace has been transformed into a gigantic, icy Quincy Cross, atop which sits a newly built Quincy cityscape, Varvelt, the final battleground of Bleach itself. I have to be honest, it is a very dramatic shift, but I do quite like how it looks here in the anime. The oppressive black sky around them gives the impression that Varvelt exists within a void, while Varvelt itself carries with it a glistening purple glow that makes everything appear ghostly and strange. I definitely prefer it to the red sky of part 2, but at the same time is there an explanation for why the sky has now become totally dark? Why would the Quincy want to live this way? I mean, I guess they've been living this way for a thousand years, so maybe that's the point. Also, isn't the sky already being this dark going to interfere with Kyoraku's Bankai somewhat? Its area of effectability is meant to darken the sky, after all. Looking at the new city sprawling out before him, Basby is clearly angry. This is, after all, what he was sacrificed for. 
Yoroichi notes that their team was spared being caught up in the transformation because they were in the Garganta at the time, before she recognises Yushiro's Reiatsu in the air. As Yoroichi reveals that she has a brother to a shocked Ichigo, the anime cuts the comedic scenes of Ichigo and the others trying to imagine what Yoroichi's brother might look like. From an all-powerful Hakuda master to a cat in a Shihakusho, which did make me laugh. As Yushiro also senses his sister from across the city, he immediately takes off into the air to try and reach her only to suddenly plummet from the sky to his apparent doom. Luckily, Renji grabs the falling Yushiro's arm and hoists him back onto solid ground, as Byakia realises the Quincy's have purposefully made it nearly impossible for the Shinigami to make footholds with Reishi like usual. Again, highlighting the innate power of the Quincy's in a really cool way, Byakia explains that the Reishi density in the Royal Palace is unusually high, as we saw when Rukia and Renji first arrived in Ichibei's dojo. And that usually they'd be able to make footholds here with no problem at all, so there's only one reason as to why they can't this time around. The Reishi here is now completely under the control of the Quincy, and they've made the battleground disadvantageous to the Shinigami. It's a cool concept, though I'll be interested to see if the anime does anything with this notion. It doesn't really seem to matter at all when the Shinigami can leap miles into the sky anyway without any repercussions. Byakia then notes that this kind of power is fitting for one who could kill the Soul King, to which Soifon confirms that yes, she can't feel the Soul King's Reiatsu at all anymore. And by the way, when did Soifon remove all of her bandages? She was originally completely covered in them from head to toe, but I guess they're no longer needed. Anyway, Kyoraku steps up, optimistically noting that at the very least, he can still feel the Reiatsu of Ichigo's gang somewhere in the distance, meaning their advanced troops weren't wiped out after all. Gathering the Gote 13 behind him, including Mashiro, who has travelled up to Varvelt with them, it's one thing having new scenes, but now we've got characters appearing in the final battle that simply weren't there in the manga, which is exciting. Kyoraku tells them to move forward for the Gote 13, and that if the Soul King really is dead, then they simply need to defeat the enemy and choose a new one. Kyoraku believes that's what Ukitake would say if he could talk. Again, interesting deliberate verbiage. That to me again seems to imply that Ukitake might still be alive? Suddenly, however, as the team prepares to move, the entire cityscape rumbles once again, the ground quaking beneath them. Basby looks ahead as several buildings are demolished to the blaring trumpets of one of the Vandenreich's musical pieces, the very earth itself seemingly rising up, something gigantic bursting out of the ground beneath the cityscape. Before the Gote 13's eyes, an enormous multi-tiered fortress rises up, towering over them and the city streets in a pure display of might. With Silburn itself perched atop this central stronghold, Yuhabark's new palace looms over all as the nexus of Varvelt itself, a single guiding star made of gleaming bone-white stone against the deep dark backdrop of the black sky. I always did absolutely adore this new fortress. I mean, it looks incredible both here and in the manga. It was the kind of intricate, detailed building that we hadn't seen from Kubo in quite some time, and it really stood out as a momentous moment and another incredible achievement for Yuhabak. I love the shot of the fortress in the distance as the Gote 13 stands amidst the streets of the city. What an incredible, immense sense of scale. As Kisuke comments that it's like they are being challenged to a fight, Kyoraku sneers that the enemy has some nerve indeed. For the final scene of the episode, the anime combines the end of chapter 628 with the opening of chapter 629, as we find ourselves deep within Yuhabark's personal throne room, which is now apparently a hot pink for some reason. 
I'm not sure I really dig the new colour scheme of this room, I have to be honest, especially considering this means that, at least initially, the battle between Ichigo, Orohime and Yu Harbark will also be doused in this colour as well. I like the colour scheme for Varvelt, I think it's pretty cool. This one, I'm not so convinced by, I need to see it a little bit more, I think, but it just doesn't feel like it fits Yu Harbark to me. I think it should be way more sinister, way more ominous, a lot darker in, and just creepier in general than wherever this pink light is coming from, but maybe it'll grow on me in the future. As the Schutzstoffel kneel before their king, Yu Harbach sits upon his seat of power at the very center of this brand new world. Hashwolf informs Yu Harbach that Ichigo's group and the Gote 13 have both arrived, trespassed upon their new holy land, as Yu Harbach declares it will be known as Varvelt, the foundation of the one and only true world that will soon be made. Before his master, Hashwolf announces that they will kill each and every intruder in order to realise the future reflected in Yu Harbach's eyes, right here in their new Varvelt. The episode comes to a close as we see the determined faces of the Schutzstoffel before the godly gaze of Yu Harbach himself. Next time, the fighting begins for real. I have to admit, I do think Yu Harbark looks a lot cooler in the manga during this sequence for starters. In the anime, he looks weirdly small on his throne. In the manga, he looks absolutely massive and overbearing, and most of his eyes have been shut during this sequence in the manga, so he is just kind of covered in this black shadow that makes him look really, really cool. In the anime here, he doesn't look quite as good or as threatening, I don't think, but still, this sequence is very cool. The poem this week is absolutely an interesting one, read by none other than Renji, and it goes as follows. The fire that drips from fangs does not fade. The blade burns away the field, revealing my hidden friend. I mean, this is obviously very intriguing. I was expecting Basby to get the poem this week, so that perhaps implies that the friend battle isn't happening until episode 34 at the earliest. But what does Renji's poem actually mean? I have no idea who this hidden friend is. That's definitely the most exciting part. But the line, the blade burns away the field, seems to be a reference to the title of volume 73, which has Renji on the cover, Battlefield Burning, a name that doesn't actually appear as the title of any chapter, and so was always an interesting choice. There's no Sternritter in memoriam once again this week, so let's move on to the predictions, of which I have a couple. In regards to what we can expect to see from the upcoming episode 33, well, I'm definitely intrigued. It seems to me like there is potentially some empty space here, as I'm expecting the episode to end with Basby, Lil Toto and Giselle arriving at Silburn, meaning the anime can fill the episode with new content. At least, that's what I'm hoping. The fact that the poem for this episode features Renji is also perplexing. Speculation has been running rampant around Renji for some time now, he features heavily in the opening for part three, despite not having anything to do during this section of the story in the manga, and in the trailer for part three, we can see him activating Bankai. Again, something he doesn't do in the manga here. So, what's going on? Some people have speculated that Renji will join Basby in his battle against Hashwolf, but that doesn't really make any sense to me, to be honest. The prediction that I do subscribe to, however, is the idea that Renji might battle Uryu. In the same trailer, we saw Renji using Bankai. We also see Uryu drawing his bow in the streets of Varvelt, and you guessed it, this never happens in the manga. Could Renji battle Uryu and suffer a brutal fate similar to Ichigo's in the palace? Perhaps Renji's hidden friend here is referring to Uryu. The two do have some history together as they team up to battle Xyloporo in the Waco Mundo arc. I'm just saying the shots of the two of them do appear one after the other in the opening, and so far it's been showing off all of the fights to come in the core. Speaking of which, I actually wonder if we might get another additional fight next week, and that's 
Grimjo versus Askin. While Grimjo attempts to attack Askin in the manga, causing Askin to run away, that's really all we get. However, what I find interesting is that in the preview images for next week, we have this shot of Askin. And now this is likely from when he initially defeats Grimjo in chapter 635, which should take place after Basby's battle with Hashwolf. Instead, it looks like they might be bringing that forward. And I also think this shot of Grimjo might be brand new. So I can't help but wonder if these two might clash a little bit next week in an extended sequence, ending with Askin defeating Grimjo. Imagine if Ichigo and Grimjo actually fight side by side for a bit. Anyway, that's it for episode 32 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, titled The Holy Newborn and my spoiler review and discussion. As always, I really hope you enjoyed it and I hope you took something of value away from this video as well. Let me know down in the comments below, what did you think of the entire Rayo's Death sub arc? What did you think of episode 32, The Holy Newborn in particular? What was your favourite moment and what are you most excited to see moving forwards? What are you expecting to see from episode 33 titled Gate of the Sun. Do you think my predictions are right in the ballpark? Could they be spot on? Or am I totally wrong? Do please let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, guys, I want to end the video by saying a massive thank you and giving a huge shout out to my wonderful supporters over on Patreon, without whom I simply wouldn't be able to do this. If you like what I do here over on YouTube, if you enjoy my work and you want to help support the channel to help keep it going, thank you so, so very much. By supporting me at the $1 tier a month, you can get your name in the credits of every single video just like this alongside everybody else who helps to make this a reality. And at a $2 tier or higher, you can enjoy every single one of my videos absolutely free of baked in YouTube ads. All right, everyone. Thank you again so, so very much for watching. Until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.